This film made possible by Merrimack County Savings Bank BCM Environmental and Land Law, PLLC and the Norwin S. and Elizabeth N. Bean Foundation. So it all started with the water. It all started with the water. And so the forest owes its existence to the Merrimack River. All rivers rise and fall over the course of a day, a season, a year. For the last century and a half, many rivers have seen their health rise and fall as well. The Merrimack is one of those rivers, and its story seems to repeat itself every 50 years or so, though in different ways. Do you think that people who are working here care about the river at all? I think that a lot of people in my building really like watching it. I don't know how much they care about it, <laughs> but I think they enjoy looking at it. So what does the Merrimack River mean to you? It doesn't really mean yeah. much to me. I don't remember the first time I encountered the Merrimack. It's just always been there. I was born in its watershed, grew up playing in the lakes and streams that feed it, and as an adult, I am working to protect the land surrounding the river and its tributaries. Did you know that actually, even though this river seems like really nice to swim in and pretty clear, it's one of the most endangered rivers? Endangered, what does that mean exactly? In the United States? Endangered. Nearly 50 years ago, the Clean Water Act began the process that cleaned up America's rivers, turning them from open sewers into places that support wildlife and people in countless ways. But today, the Merrimack is again on the verge of taking a step backward, putting at risk those things previous generations worked so hard to protect. It's really dirty, stinky. Maybe we don't think about the river as much as we once did. You know, we're driving up 93 to get to the forest, and we're crossing over the river on the way and not really thinking that much about it. For the last few years, I've been thinking about the Merrimack a lot and exploring the watershed and talking to people who think about it every day, from river guides to water treatment managers to foresters. This is my journey to understand why the Merrimack is at risk. My journey begins in Franklin, New Hampshire, where the Pemigewasset and Winnipesaukee rivers converge to form the Merrimack. 117 miles later, the river empties into the Gulf of Maine and the Atlantic Ocean on the north shore of Massachusetts. At 5,000 square miles, it is the fourth largest watershed in New England. In the Merrimack watershed, rivers such as the Kuntukuk, Sauhegan, Nashua, and Concord, in addition to many other streams and brooks, all drain into the Merrimack as it flows to the ocean. To many, the river might appear clean, healthy, and far from at risk. But in 2016, the nonprofit American Rivers, using U.S. Forest Service data and projections, ranked the Merrimack as one of the most endangered rivers in the U.S. due to increased levels of stormwater runoff and pollution. It's not the first time the river's health has been in jeopardy. To learn more, we need to go back more than a century to see if its history could provide some solutions to the problems it faces today. So could you start by taking us back 100 years and kind of describing what we would see here sure. um, instead of this kind of beautiful, clear, flowing river. Well, a lot of days it probably looked just like this. The differences are a couple. One is that this was very much a working river. Mm. This was an industrial river. This is the birthplace, the you know, lower on the Merrimack, is the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution in America. Lowell and Lawrence and the, all of the, the people doing the textiles and all of those factories down there. All of that meant that this was a serious working river. 
all of that required power. Power required water. That's why they, that's why all of these mills were on these rivers is because they needed the power, the power of the water. The Merrimack River starts up in the Pema Jawasset and in Lake Winnipesaukee. Lake Winnipesaukee was owned by the mill owners down mm -hmm. in Lawrence and Lowell. Mm -hmm. They manipulated the levels of this lake daily to generate power down there. So while it might not look that different than it does today, if you were standing down closer to the river, you would see it fluctuate dramatically mm. from day to day, from hour to hour, with no notice whatsoever. Mm. All of a sudden, millions and millions of gallons could be rushing down. Geographically, why was this place chosen even before? Uh, the power. It's actually mainly because the Merrimack River at this location had enough power to run more than 55 factories. Wow. And the investors knew they could purchase the farmland from the farmers. Mm -hmm. They had the power. The canal had already been built, so they had an idea of how to move that power right to the factories. And once the water, okay, is even on both sides of the gate, okay, the pressure is released and then they'll be able to open it by hand. Wow. So and you'll see that actually operating. So what's interesting is that when you think about um, the textile business, they came in 1821, uh, were able to look at the site, calculate the power of the Merrimack River at this site, hire an agent to come in and buy the land, the water rights, mm -hmm. start digging in 1822, start building the mills. By the fall of 1823, the Merrimack Mills, which was the first mills, started producing cloth. So um, today, okay, I'm gonna tell you, this is a beautiful <laughs> river, all right? When I actually was born and bred here in Lowell, and you didn't come down to the river, all right? The river was um, in a horrible state. You remember um, as a kid, your- There was your... dead fish, there was, um, it was polluted, there was actually, you know, raw sewage coming through the system. Um, you did not go on the river. If you fell in, you'd probably go to the hospital and get a tetanus shot, okay? Uh, I'm just saying, it was one of the worst polluted rivers in New England. We had these mighty rivers that were being used for industrial purposes, and they were being heavily, heavily manipulated. Not only were they manipulated in their flow, but all of the waste from all of those mills for all of the years really from that period a hundred and some years ago up until the 1950s and 60s, all of that waste had to go somewhere and it went right here. So as the cities began to develop, all of their sewage began to get piped, had to go somewhere. About 150 years ago, this became an open sewer. Really? So while it might have looked okay at the surface, there were probably times when it was pretty darn nasty, especially after a rainstorm it would have been frothy <laughs> with human waste. Oh, wow. That's a visual. <laughs> so what was a major change in people's ideology that caused them to start caring about the Merrimack River? Well, I think this really tracks back to the environmental awakening that happened kind of in the late 50s and 60s. There was a lot of people looking at the river that was changing colors depending on whatever they happened to be dying at the mill that day mm -hmm. and thinking, maybe this isn't so good. And the fact that people really couldn't swim in the river. Um, you know, they, they joked about the, the eyeless brown trout, um, which is just human waste. Uh, so, you know, those are the jokes that were about the river. And I think people started identifying, oh my goodness, this maybe isn't good for me. It's not good for my family. Um, the water as a resource was also becoming more important. Uh, for using in other kinds of industries. You know, how do we use this, this resource in new ways as manufacturing starts to decline? Mm -hmm. And our cities uh, were going through urban renewal at the same time. So all of that was making people really think differently about their neighborhoods, about their river, about their locale. And certainly the, the first Earth Day and then the passage of the Clean Water Act has cemented that public uh, sentiment into law. And that's what we've now been in, uh, implementing since 1975 or so. We've been into implementing the Clean Water Act. And the goal of the Clean Water Act is simple. 
Very simple. <laughs> All of the water in the state is going to be fishable and swimmable by 1982. We're not quite there, but we're getting closer. We're not quite there? We're not really? quite there. Really? Really? Really. We've cleaned up the river considerably in the last 50 years, even if we still have work to do. But why should we care that the river is at risk for more pollution? An obvious answer may be to protect the wildlife and fish that call the river home. But more than two and a half million people live within the Merrimack River watershed too. How does the river impact their lives? For one thing, 600,000 people get their drinking water from the Merrimack and its tributaries every day. Can you tell us a little bit about Penichuk? We now serve Nashua as well as part of 10 other communities. Mm -hmm. In essence, we serve over 100,000 people out of this facility. Our primary water supply for the Penichuk Water Works Company is the Penichuk Brook watershed. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Penichuk Brook eventually flows into the Merrimack River. That's our primary source mm -hmm. of supply. Our backup source of supply is the Merrimack River, mm -hmm. um, and that's a seasonal uh, draw. So uh, how frequently do you have to draw from the uh, Merrimack pr River? Um, probably daily uh, sure during, during the spring, summer, and fall months. So Phil, where are we? What room are we standing in oh, right we're, now? We're in the pipe gallery of our new renovated water treatment facility. We provide water for about 160,000 residents. A little over 10% of the state is serviced by the Manchester Water Works. Wow. John, you're the forester for the Manchester Water Works. What is the connection between forests and the watershed? It, it really all began with the forests here. Um, the, the Manchester Water Works started uh, water treatment back in 1871 by buying up the land around Lake Massabesic and around all the streams, tributaries, and ponds. And at that point, they were cleared lands for agriculture, uh, mainly for sheep farming, for the textile industry and they would buy land and plant trees as a, as a filter to filter uh, the water, the rainwater, um, that made it into Lake Massabesic for the drinking water source. So the trees were really that first filter. That's really the original water treatment that was done um, for drinking water. And so they started managing the lands uh, back in the 1870s. They were purchasing land and then converting them to forest land and then managing that forest land for healthy forests. Um, and, and our motto is healthy forests equal clean water. So Massabesic at its 24,000 acres or 42 square mile watershed is a sub watershed of the greater Merrimack River watershed. And it's really rainfall that replenishes it. Well, do you anticipate needing to find another source at some point for drinking water in it's, Manchester? It, it has been part of uh, our long-term uh, vision at the Manchester Waterworks to uh, look at other sources uh, as, a, as a backup, uh, whether it be uh, for times of drought, but also just, you know, if there was ever anything that happened here that um, contaminated the water supply um, to have another source. We, we've been working over on the Merrimack River and we actually put a well in on the Merrimack River and that's going to be basically a backup or a complementary source to Massabesic. Should, should we be worried about our drinking water resources here in the state? It's always, I've always turned on the faucet and I've always gotten water to yeah. come out. It's a vital resource. It's the source of life. When we look at what we do, we, we actually provide a product that is essential to life. So should you be concerned? Yes, because it's not just about how much water you have, what's the quality of the water? Are you protecting that as a long-term asset? From Concord to Lowell to Newburyport, every day people rely on the Merrimack for clean drinking water. How else does a clean river benefit people that live and work in the watershed? As it has done for more than a century, the river continues to be an economic engine for communities large and small. We're not manufacturing cloth here in Lowell any longer, but the waterways are used for power today. They are, and so, explain the ways they're used for power today. So today, um, these waterways, we have 5.6 miles of canals. Um, they're actually feeding into a hydroelectric plant. They're also feeding into water turbines that are located in the uh, basement of some of the mills here in Lowell. And those water turbines that at one time was powering machinery, today is actually generating electricity that goes onto the national grid. Big place here. Yeah, 
that it is. Yeah, we're just under uh, 500,000 square feet. Wow. Run uh, one can line, three bottle lines, 24-7. Yeah, and how many employees do you all have here? Uh, little seasonal, but in the summer we're about 130. In the off season we're uh, about 110. What's being produced out on the floor today? Uh, right now we're running, um, like Moxie on the can line is running today, Minute Maid Lemonade and a, and a variety of other flavors on the on the two liter, and then one liter ginger ale and 20 ounce fused tea. Oh yeah, and we saw that as we were out there kind of walking around and it was pretty amazing for me to see, I mean, how much goes into this. I kind of expect there to be a lot of, there, a lot of process, but it's a, it's a pretty amazing facility. What I'm realizing though is the main ingredient here isn't necessarily the, the secret, you know, Coca-Cola recipe, it's water. True, yeah. And so where do you get your water from? Yeah, water is definitely our biggest ingredient. Um, our, our water right now comes from uh, Lake Massabesic via Manchester Waterworks. And uh, it, like I said, it's, it's the biggest uh, ingredient we have here. It's also one of the most protected that we have. How reliable is the water in terms of like seasonality and then the quality of the water? In general, over the 12 months out of the year, it's, it's, uh, it's great quality water. How much water do you get in every, every day? It varies. Uh, typically, uh, to run four lines or the volume that we need to run, it's in the neighborhood of 100,000 gallons per day through our water treatment system. Um, could range up to 150,000 on a big day that's more Dasani. And that output, what does that look like? How much stuff are you sending out of here a day? If you're product wise? Yeah, product wise. Yeah, we send uh, about 100,000 cases a day. How have you seen the business change? Definitely the, the trends and things that people are interested in, hiring practices, uh, the types of benefits that you need to offer to attract people, those have all changed a lot over time. While we're on the topic of benefits, I think one of the neat things about being able to work here is that because we are near the river, we have access. We put, during a renovation, we put a dock on the Turkey River, which feeds uh, just behind our building. It feeds right into the Merrimack. Mm -hmm. So you can, on your lunch break, you can paddle around or you can paddle to work. Sometimes we have paddle to work days, which are a lot of fun. Uh, and you can really enjoy the natural beauty that we have. And I think it's so easily forgotten that the Merrimack cuts through the heart of Concord and it's such a beautiful resource. Oh, absolutely. Explain a little bit more about the boat to work day. So we go, it's about five and a half miles up river. We rent the, the boats for people. Some people mm -hmm. bring their own, but we do offer to rent them for people who don't have them. Um, and then we just kind of paddle down river and it's you know about an hour or 15 minutes or so. We take our time and we go past the Capitol Dome and see some wildlife. You can al almost always count on seeing a, a blue heron or something like that. And it's just a lot of fun. It's a cool way to arrive to work. I wish I could do it every day. Neat, that's, that's really neat. So our towns and cities rely on a healthy watershed for drinking water and economic reasons. After hearing about Amanda's paddle to work day, it made me wonder, is recreation an important resource? So what we're all about is creating community through conservation. And we do that in a variety of ways. It might be through creating trail access or trail connectivity. Uh, we do it through environmental education. Can you describe to me where, where, what we're standing on right here? Sure, this is the Concord River Greenway. Uh, and we're just upriver from the from Jolene Dubner Park, and you're looking at a historic stone arch bridge. Oh, cool. So the Concord River Greenway is a pretty critical link in the city's trail network, and actually the region's trail network. Is it relatively easy for people to access these green areas or the river? Um, how far do people generally have to travel from their home or from where they work to get to a place? The city is fortunate to have over 90 parks. You know, generally speaking, you want to think about trying to make every park walkable, which means you need to be able to get there by not walking more than a quarter of a mile. And you also go down the river, you raft the river every spring? We do. The, we're really fortunate in the, on the Concord here that we have class three and four white water. It's also a really unique run in that the rapids are boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of downtime in between. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, it's a pretty thrilling trip. Cool. People don't expect it in the middle of a city. Mm -mm. So when you're um, paddling or rafting down the river, what do you see? Uh, really abundant wildlife. You see this green corridor. 
Oh, so you're and, not up against and people buildings? Don't, no, you're not up against buildings until you get downtown, and then we, it's kind of like um, uh, the Grand Canyon or the Red Canyon. Mm. You end up going through Brick these high buildings. walls. <laughs> yeah, the high historic um, brick walls when the river was channelized. But up here, you go through this wonderful green quarter that people don't expect. So it's just, it's just beautiful. What other changes have you seen along the river in your 22 years of working along its banks? Probably more use. Uh, we now have uh, pontoon boats and fishing boats that go up the river. Mm -hmm. Of course, all the paddlers, but not just paddlers from here, but people putting their own boats on, people swimming, people tubing. So in the last, we've been here 25 years, so in the last 15 years, we've seen a steady increase in just people using the river enjoying the beaches, enjoying the scenery, enjoying the hiking trails, and then swimming after hiking the trails. It's, so just river usage is just, it's grown dramatically. The Merrimack in this neck of the woods is, is pretty big water. Uh, it is uh, tidally influenced um, up, up this far and um, you know, it's, uh, it's quite a bit different than the upper reaches in New Hampshire. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a spot that is super important for uh, a variety of recreational uses, lots of fishing, lots of boating, um, but it's, it's big water. So aside from recreational uses, what other ways do people use the river down here? It's an important source of drinking water for, for some communities, but it's, it's important as a, as, a, as a scenic resource. It's important for um, communities that have redeveloped their downtowns, places that have had their backs turned to the river for generations are um, building river walks and waterfront trails. And again, it's, it's that intersection of economic development, uh, recreational use, and it's all predicated upon having a clean, healthy river. As Chris just said, economic development and recreation are predicated upon having a clean, healthy river. Up to this point in my journey, the river and its tributaries appear to be nothing but clean. We use it for drinking water, recreating, and running businesses. So can a river with this much to offer be at risk? The Industrial Revolution has gone elsewhere. Most of the manufacturing that happens here, while a lot of it is still done on the Merrimack River, mm. you know, the redevelopment of the mills in, in Manchester and in Nashua and Lawrence and Lowell, it's no longer as messy. Mm. They don't use the river as their, their open sewer. And that's the other big change, is that we now have plumbing. And that plumbing goes to a wastewater treatment plant. And we have a wastewater treatment plant that does amazing, amazing work to take that human waste and turn it into really clean water. In fact, sometimes I hear some of the wastewater treatment plant op operators complain when they look at the stringent requirements placed upon them. They say, do you understand that it's your river that's making my waste dirty? So <laughs> they're, they are pumping out lots of really clean water. Mm. It's high tech. And we have some of the best operators of these wastewater treatment plants anywhere in the country. They win awards all the time. Mm. In the Merrimack watershed, there are 46 plants that do a great job, most of the time. Of the 46 plants, six of them, two in New Hampshire and four in Massachusetts, struggle to treat the large volume of raw sewage combined with storm runoff that inundates their aging infrastructure during heavy rain events. To avoid having sewage back up into homes and businesses, the plants discharge what they can't treat into the river in what is called a Combined Sewer Overflow, or CSO. 
Every year, upwards of three quarters of a billion gallons of raw sewage is discharged into the Merrimack during CSO events. When a CSO happens, bacteria, such as E. coli, can remain in the river for up to 48 to 72 hours, threatening the health of people, wildlife, and even our pets. And climate change is causing more frequent CSO events, so on some days, the river is cleaner than others. One of the predictions of climate change, and I think that most people would say it's already here, is that we're getting more of our precipitation in fewer events. So we're getting more and more of that, uh, the big rainstorms, the really devastating rainstorms, the kinds of things that, that break dams and, and, and devour uh, the river, uh, the banks of the river. Those are happening more frequently. And with that rain, with those intense rainstorms, comes more pollution off the land. With an increase in intense rains and storm runoff, we will see an increase in CSOs. Eliminating CSOs completely will cost municipalities hundreds of millions of dollars to update their infrastructure. Here's the thing, even if we spend millions of dollars to put an end to CSOs, the Merrimack watershed faces a bigger challenge that even our water treatment plants would not be able to fix. Keeping sewage out of the river is part of the solution but it won't clean it up completely. So, if this is the case, what is the biggest challenge the river faces in the future? And what are our biggest threats to water quality? Surface waters here sure. in the state. By far the largest threat today of surface water quality is stormwater runoff. Mm -hmm. So stormwater runoff is the water that reaches paved surfaces, and some of the time it's even gravel surfaces, in our lawns included in that, and it reaches, the, the rain falls and it washes off whatever stuff happens to be on those surfaces. So on our roads, there's, you know, little bits of your tires, there's little bits of your brakes off mm. of your car, there's all the just grime, there's their atmospheric deposition coming down. Uh, so we have uh, sulfides and nitrates that are falling from the, from, from the air that come from other places. Mm. We have mercury that comes from the burning of fossil fuels that falls on our surfaces and washes into our waters. So all of those things contribute to us having poorer water quality as a result of some of that stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff is a form of non-point source pollution. As rainfall and snowmelt move over and through the ground, it carries sediment from improperly managed construction sites animal waste and pesticides from farms, petroleum products and salts from roads, toxic chemicals from manufacturing sites, and fertilizer and bacteria from our homes and yards. Before wastewater treatment plants existed, forests were the only resource communities could rely on to filter runoff. Forests hold back natural and human-made pollutants from contaminating water sources, including lakes, rivers, and groundwater. Unlike a forest, an impervious surface, such as a paved parking lot, can't keep pollutants from spilling into a storm drain and ultimately the river. The rainwater that falls in the watershed, say on a mountainside in Franconia Notch, or a farm in Penacook, or on I-93 in Lawrence, all affects the Merrimack in some way. Uh, salt is a huge issue. So the way we're salting our roads, and the demand that we have as our God-given right as Americans to get to Walmart on the absolute worst conditions possible, maybe we should rethink that a little bit. <laughs> maybe we can drive a little slower when it's winter. Those are some of the things that we have to think about because we have water bodies that are literally toxic with salt in this state. It's gotten deep in the groundwater, it's slowly seeping out, and those waters no longer support fish. Probably uh, the two biggest threats that I see to drinking water is uh, um, developments, um, whether it be commercial or residential developments, and roading and roadways. And they usually come hand in hand. And what you get with, um, and a lot of that is nutrients loading into the, the, uh, the brooks and streams and eventually into the lake. And those nutrients will feed um, algae and plant life. And you'll get an imbalance of too much plant life in your, 
in your lake and it'll become like a marsh. And so being shallow, Massabesic is vulnerable to becoming a marsh. History has a way of repeating itself in the Merrimack watershed, as this is not the first time the river has faced runoff issues. 120 years ago, when the Lower Merrimack was the backbone of America's burgeoning industrial revolution, the forests in the upper watershed were facing threats that would ultimately change the outlook of eastern forests forever. New Hampshire has such a diverse landscape. We've seen developed areas in the southern part of the state, and now we're here in the middle of the forest. How are all these places connected? That's a great question. I mean, forests ultimately have a close relationship with the history of the Merrimack River and the, especially the upper Pemigewasset River. Because if not for the river, the forest would not have been saved in the first place. We're walking through a floodplain forest along the edge of the river. That's the central artery of New Hampshire. But if you look into the history, you realize that the river gave rise to what's now our national forest. How, when did that happen? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have to go back to the turn of the century and understand that logging in the White Mountains and the subsequent fires from clear cuts led to erosion. And that affected the river in really profound ways through uh, the removal of the tree canopy and the baking of the soil and then heavy rains and erosion resulted in siltation of the river. And that changed the hydrology of the Merrimack River. And in fact, uh, there was a series of devastating fires in the White Mountains in the 1880s and 1890s. And then the worst year was 1903. There was a series of devastating floods that actually shut down the largest textile mill in the world, the Amiskeg Manufacturing in Manchester, New Hampshire. And 10,000 workers were laid off and the mill was closed for two months. And so the river's behaving erratically. There's floods in the spring, there's droughts in the summertime, and they didn't have a reliable source of water. And then when it started becoming unpredictable, People started scratching their heads and wondering. And jobs you know, are being lost. And jobs are being lost. Yeah. And mills are being shut down. Mm -hmm. People got together to protect the power of the river for economic interest, for commerce, for their livelihoods. And as a result, they set aside that land in the headwaters that is now one of 40 Eastern National Forests that traces its origins to the struggle to protect the water power for New England. Wow. So when the White Mountain National Forest burned to the ground, it still had seeds in the soil. The forest was able to regrow, but what you're saying is that this threat is insidious in nature because the human impacts that we are having along the river are a little bit more permanent. I think so. And, you know, it would seem that the forest was uh, devastated by the logging and the fires and the erosion and the forest was certainly fragile, but it was also incredibly resilient. Uh, I think our predecessors would be amazed to see this, you know, cloak of forest land on 790,000 acres. It's all public land that's owned by the U.S. Forest Service. It's, a, you know, a gem of northern New Hampshire. Um, and that impact on the river is keeping that water clean and cold and predictable in terms of the way that the forest releases water into the watershed. Um, but in the southern part of the state, you know, that's not the case. The lands and the communities around the Merrimack are not like the lands in the White Mountain National Forest. And so the, the lands in the southern part of the watershed are changing permanently. Even as we've got this victory, we've protected the headwaters. The loss of an acre of forest wouldn't cause irreparable harm to the watershed. But the cumulative impact of these losses over many years paints a concerning picture. By 2030, the U.S. Forest Service projects that the Merrimack watershed will lose more forested acres than any other watershed in the country. 
Between 1990 and 2010, approximately 100,000 acres of forest in the watershed were replaced with roads, parking lots, and rooftops. And by 2030, the amount of land projected to change from rural in character to urban or suburban could surpass 400,000 acres. This rise in housing density puts the watershed at risk for more runoff, which threatens water quality and the health of people and wildlife. One notable change in the lower Merrimack is the loss of some of New England's oldest farmland to development. Although agriculture produces some non-point source pollution in the form of animal waste and fertilizers, farms in this part of the watershed have some of the most fertile soils in the region, contributing greatly to our local food economy. Does losing farmland affect the river in the same way that losing our forests does? The Merrimack Valley has a tremendous number of farms that are still in existence. In fact, some of the oldest, longest, continuously operating farms in the country are right here in the Merrimack Valley, which is really a neat aspect of here and one of the things that we really want to try to help preserve. It's very much part and parcel of the history here, the culture. The majority of that land is not preserved and is very threatened. It's flat, it's open, it's easily developable. Um, a lot of these farmers don't have successors. So um, let me see if I get this, this right. You're just trying to keep farmland in operation and you um, want to ensure that it's, it's always, that it stays that way. What's the alternative? What would the alternative look like? The alternative, if, if preservation is in the part of the picture, is development and you see that happening over and over. Every landowner I talk with who has more than 10 acres is getting phone calls from developers asking them if they want to sell their land. Farmers love their land. Uh, lots of people love their land, but mm -hmm. farmers especially, and the farmers that I work with, this is family land. This is land that has been in their name for generations, and it's it's not only their livelihood, it's who they are, and um, they don't want to develop it, and they want to see it stay in farming. Um, and I think having active, productive farms is key to protecting the river as well. I mean, I know that you know, there's concern about runoff from farmland polluting the rivers, but I think a healthy, sustainable farm can be much healthier for the river than, than subdivision. A lot of the farms in the Merrimack River Valley have a tremendous amount of forest land that they keep intact because they use these forests. They, these are active, productive forests. They have mills on their property, they, har they harvest timber, they sell wood, they sell firewood. That's a sort of an accessory use to their farm. And so protecting these farms also protects significant amount of woodlands, which also plays a huge role in, in protecting water quality and keeping the water around here clean. In Merrimack, Belknap, and Hillsborough counties, the three biggest counties in the New Hampshire portion of the watershed, the rate of population growth is nearly two times greater than the New England average. Businesses are thriving in the region, and people want to live where there's access to natural resources like lakes, rivers, and forests. If this region wants to continue to thrive in the future, don't we need some development? watershed is actually quite forested still, still intact. Um, right now we have about 17 to 18 percent of the watershed is developed. Um, so, so that's that leaving mean, What almost, does that mean to me? Like so it means well, like it's, houses, it's, parking lots, or? Correct. Correct cities. You know Nashua and Manchester and Lowell and Lawrence. You know that developed area where the concentration of people is the highest. But if you come back out into the watershed, the watershed is much larger than the river itself. And you're dealing with an area um, that is largely forested. The development due to the increased transportation, I-93 is being opened up, being enlarged. People can get further and further up and away from the cities to, for their living. And that's resulting in more and more fragmentation of the forest. Uh, and we're seeing that throughout the watershed. What is your projection or what do you see 
happening for development in the Merrimack Valley? I think, uh, I think there'll be steady growth. I think the southern part of the state, I, I think you're going to see those communities that are, are actively engaged in economic development are going to thrive and you're going to see smaller towns start to thin out and die out. We're seeing an extremely low vacancy rate for rental units and a very high demand which drives up cost. Um, so people are paying a lot of money for rental units and in the housing market, so for people trying to buy a home right now, there's not a lot available in the lower price range. And when you think about jobs in New Hampshire, um, we need people to fill those jobs and to keep up with the economic growth that New Hampshire has seen. We have one of the lowest unemployment rates. So for businesses to thrive in New Hampshire, if they want to grow, they need to find people to work here. And so if people are having a hard time and a challenge with housing, which is it goes hand in hand with um, working, it, they're not going to be able to come here. And so businesses aren't going to be able to grow. And um, it's going to create a, a slowed a slowed economy in New Hampshire eventually. More than just CSOs and non-point source pollution are threatening the watershed. Cancer-causing toxins known as PFASs and PFOAs have been found in drinking water sources. Hydroelectric dams block the passage of anadromous fish, including salmon and shad and microplastics are harming human and wildlife populations in profound ways. It can be overwhelming, but as history has shown, the Merrimack watershed has faced challenges that it has overcome before. The big question moving forward is, how can we protect the river? The, the, the most important thing that we can do to really start to understand our resource is to go touch it. They should come down, they should look at it, they should get in it, because then they'll care about it. When you're out talking to people, maybe not in this area, but where they're comfortable in schools or elsewhere, do you find that they, they get it? Do they, do they care about the water here? I, oh, I believe they do. I believe they do. I mean, the, the people that, uh, you know, water is becoming more and more of, uh, of concern for the public with different challenges that have come forward. Things like PFOAs that have been coming up in the newspaper, water getting contaminated. People understand that we need water for life, you know, that we can't exist without water. Assuming that there's going to be additional development here in the Merrimack Valley, how should that look? Start with using, recognizing that the Merrimack River itself is a tremendous asset to attract families, to attract businesses to come here because it adds to that quality of life, recreationally, scenically, everything else. I think one of the key challenges is making sure that there's some continuity between communities. It won't do, won't do any good in the long run if Concord protects uh, its part of the river, but then we found out hooks it didn't. Uh, the river's more than just one community. The valley's larger than just Concord. So I think there needs to be a regional approach to how we plan the future of all development. And I think there'll be a lot of differing voices from people who want to protect the river and keep it completely undeveloped to developers who would like to line it with condominiums. There's a balance. The decision making should err on the side of caution. So hands down, if you look across all the literature, the best possible thing you can do is to have a buffer. The bigger the buffer, the better. So about a 100-foot buffer will help to protect water quality to a significant extent. Mm -hmm. So really, that, that first 100 feet is really critical for water quality. And what happens in that 100 feet? Nature. Nature happens. <laughs> but really what happens is that you have all of the activity of the vegetation, you have the microbial activity in the soil, you have the trees that are intercepting, uh, the rain with all of its pollution that's in the rain and the snow, it's all being intercepted, it's all being used up and recycled, and so all of that's happening in, in the, on the land next to the water. That's protecting water quality. If you really want to protect for wildlife, then you need to go further. If you really want to protect for things that are you know, migratory species, you need a bigger buffer. If you really want to make sure that you have unfragmented forests, that is, forests for things that need 
a lot of habitat, things like bears and some of the big raptors and some of that kind of stuff, then you need even bigger areas. So depending on what it is that you love about that river, I happen to love the fact that river otters come here in the winter. I love that. I, have, I love the fact that there's bald eagles that fly around here. Mm -hmm. You don't have the river otters. You don't have the bald eagles unless you have conserved land. You don't have good water quality unless you have conserved land. So it's really key. Oh, there's fish flopping around in the river right oh, yeah. there. <laughs> you don't have any of that. You don't have that <laughs> unless we have conservation land because that's really the filters. That's, that's the filters that keep this water clean. So we're indebted to all of the wonderful people who've come before us who tried to protect the land along these rivers. If that had not happened, if we had development right up to the, to the, to the river itself, we would have way worse water quality. We would not be able to love these resources the way we do. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we keep what remaining green space we have, as well as it's important for a wildlife perspective and from a water quality pr perspective to tie all of these, these conservation areas together mm -hmm. so that they're not just you know, islands uh, in, in amongst pavement, mm -hmm. that we have nice contiguous areas of green, to be able to both recreate in, as well as to protect both our wildlife and our water quality. So I think conservation plays an incredibly important role in all of this. Forest Society is the coordinator of the Conservation Partnership, um, and that is an, a group of organizations, agencies, and regional planning commissions that came together about coming up on about 10 years ago. And this is the Merrimack Conservation Partnership. Correct. 33 organizations, including agencies, state agencies from both Mass and New Hampshire, mm -hmm. um, conservation groups from both Mass and New Hampshire, and then also regional planning commissions, all working towards a common goal of uh, improving water quality in the Merrimack River. What are the partners within the partnership doing right now to protect some of this land? So the partners really are in a land conservation mode. Uh, much of the work has been done to develop the conservation plan that identifies the most critical lands that would, um, if conserved, would protect the water quality in the Merrimack River. And the last, I would say, 10 years, we've been really working on implementing that plan, conserving those areas that, are, that have been previously identified as the most important to protect. So what if New Hampshire doesn't make way or doesn't make it more accessible for people to live here? What happens? Well, I think the economy will certainly will feel that. Um, we won't be able to continue thriving. So I think it's important to cater to everybody um, so we can continue having a great place to live um, and having the services that the aging population needs, but also making it a great place for the younger generation to live and to want to live um, and to afford to live. And so what are some solutions and, and maybe some sustainable solutions to that? In the city center, so when we're thinking about Nashua, Manchester, Concord even, we have to be creative and think about creative solutions, um, which is already happening. When we go out into a little more rural areas, we need to look at the land use regulations and see if they're supporting more cluster development, more dense um, development. If we can get smaller lots, smaller homes, more people on less land, I think that is what is going to help, not only with hopefully some affordability, but also lessen the impact of having to have two acres for one home. Um, and some communities are, are doing really well with that, and others I think need to um, catch up a little bit, and I think we can learn from each other and, and try to be better and support each other through change, and I think we need to evolve and think dynamically. Way back when the rivers were really heavily polluted, and you could obviously see pollutants flowing into them, the river was a different color. Um, we were talking about how you know, clear that how obvious that was. It was also probably really, really expensive. I would assume that if you're able to conserve forests, you know, higher in the watershed, that maybe the cost isn't as great in trying to clean up a river that is polluted 
if you can kind of get ahead of that and just ensure the water is clean. Right. The key to that is, as you say, if you can serve higher in the watershed, that water already coming down through the watershed is clean. You know, the communities that are having to drink from that water um, are having to treat it less, are having to, um, in some cases, are still drinking surface water um, that is coming into the, to the river. But the facilities that are needed to be built can be avoided if it's not as polluted as it comes down. Businesses that are along the river, you know, they're not having to have treated, heavily treated water. You're having communities that uh, want to have attractive places to go, want to have riverside walks. If you have a polluted river, there's not going to be the attractiveness for people to either live next to it, recreate on it. All of that drives an economy here in the lower part of the watershed um, that is very important. Clean water filters into more than just the drinking water. It filters into the economy in a whole bunch of ways. Yeah, and the livelihood of everybody who's in the watershed. With proper planning, forests are the best resource the developing Merrimack region can harness to filter our air and water, offer recreation and economic opportunities, maintain stable wildlife habitat, and combat climate change. Maintaining healthy forests is the most important action we can take to turn a river that's at risk into a river that was at risk. Today's business leaders and conservation interests should be working together about what this watershed is going to look like a hundred years from now. So what can the landscape, the natural landscape, do for the health of the river that we as humans cannot? If we can let it do its thing as, <laughs> as a watershed, um, it will continue to filter water and provide habitat for wildlife and protect the water quality so that we can continue to fish and boat and drink and use the Merrimack River you know, as the economic lifeblood of our communities. If we act now, can the Merrimack continue to sustain us? Can we save it? Let's call this real friends. Let's call this real friends. Let's call this good. I won't be frightened to let your light in and call this good. There was garbage in the water, and not only garbage, other stuff mm. that you don't even want to mention. But you used to kick hard and swim hard, <laughs> swish it around so that it wouldn't be right in front of you. I'm the third generation on this farm. The fourth generation is very active, and the fifth generation there farming many, many acres with their target toys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the 1,100 acres we farm, you know, everybody will tell you the land along the Merrimack River is <laughs> the best land to be farmed. <laughs> um, what's nice about kayak fishing is I like to see it makes you a more, you're more intimate with your fishing. You're not sitting up on a boat? It's not sitting in a boat. It's quiet. There's no motor. Um, we talk about seeing a lot of wildlife. Ooh, and he, oh, look at the colors. Oh, that's a beautiful fish. I'm getting a picture of that. That's a pumpkin seed. Thank you, fish. <laughs> well, we're standing in what we call the D&M, the Dean and Main Building. And what's behind us is the flywheel from that pump. It was built in 1900 and ran up until about 1975. And it would pump about 7 million gallons a day into the distribution system in, uh, in city Nashville. Wow. Yeah. 
I think it's definitely a priority to increase access for recreation um, to all of our waterways. The city in some places turns its back to the rivers and so we want, we want the city to be more facing the river. We want to increase visual access, physical access to the rivers um, and ponds and other waterways. When we first started doing this, a lot of people, the classic question is, how's the water? I heard you can't even dip your big toe in it. You'll get sick. There's industrial waste and dyes from fabric in it. That all went the way of the dinosaur after the Clean Water Act in 1975. And I used to call them the elephants of water quality. Big giant pipes, you can see them, you can go after them pretty readily. It's, it's kind of easy to concentrate your resources on something big. But now that those have been taken away, we're kind of dealing with what I call the ants of water quality. We're ants. River,